In June 1942, amidst the roar of the Pacific War, the USS Yorktown, one of just three U.S. carriers left after Pearl Harbor, was rushed back into battle. Barely patched together by 1,400 workers in a frantic 72 hours, she delivered a blow that helped turn the tide at Midway, only to vanish beneath the waves after a brutal enemy counterattack. For 56 years, her fate was a mystery, until a discovery in 1998 stunned the world and revealed what really happened to the lost World War II carrier. But why risk everything on a wounded ship? And how did her final hours rewrite naval history? The answer starts with the desperate gamble that sent Yorktown to war. Yorktown was far more than just another ship. She was the backbone of a battered fleet, one of only three American carriers left in the Pacific after Pearl Harbor. Commissioned in 1937, she stretched nearly 247 meters from bow to stern and could reach speeds of over 32 knots, fast enough to outrun most threats of her day. With a flight deck that could launch and recover close to 90 aircraft, Yorktown was a floating airfield, a self-contained offensive force able to strike hundreds of miles from the nearest land. Her crew of over 2,000 sailors and aviators worked in tight coordination to keep her fighting, day and night. But what set Yorktown apart was not just her size or firepower. In early 1942, the U.S. Navy's carrier strength in the Pacific was dangerously thin. Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown herself, these three were all that stood between the Japanese fleet and total dominance of the ocean. Every operation, every sortie, every risk taken by Yorktown carried outsized consequences. If she fell, the Pacific campaign would lose a third of its striking power overnight. There were no reserves waiting in the wings, no easy replacements on the horizon. The loss of a single carrier could tip the balance of the entire war in the Pacific. So when Yorktown sailed into battle, the stakes went far beyond her steel hull and wooden decks. She was a lifeline for the fleet, a rare, irreplaceable asset, carrying the hopes of a nation still reeling from disaster. Yorktown limped into Pearl Harbor on May 27, 1942, her hull still scarred from the Coral Sea. Navy inspectors took one look at the battered carrier and estimated she would need at least two weeks in dry dock, time the Pacific Fleet simply did not have. Admiral Chester Nimitz, after a personal tour of the damage, issued a simple directive. Yorktown must be ready for battle in just three days. The order set off a frenzy unlike anything the shipyard had ever seen. More than 1,400 workers, Navy and civilian, poured onto the docks, working in rolling shifts around the clock. Welders patched bomb holes with thick steel doublers, sometimes while sparks rained down onto decks still slick with fuel. Electricians spliced and rerouted cables as live current hummed through the wires. Boiler crews crawled through cramped compartments, patching leaks and jury-rigging steam lines, knowing full well that one mistake could mean disaster. Safety rules were tossed aside. No time for full fuel purges. No time to drain every tank. Hawaiian Electric cut power to parts of Honolulu so the welders could work uninterrupted. Meals were delivered to benches in the yard, and men slept in shifts wherever they could. By dawn on May 30th, the hull was sealed, the deck patched, and the elevators cleared for flight operations. Some workers were still on board, tightening bolts and checking circuits, as Yorktown slid down the channel and set course for Midway. She was not whole, but she was afloat, armed, and heading back into the fight, her fate now tied to the gamble that the repairs would hold. At 8.40 a.m. on June 4, 1942, Captain Elliot Buckmaster gave the order that would thrust Yorktown into the heart of the fight. The flight deck, still bearing the scars of Coral Sea, sprang to life as 17 SBD Dauntless dive bombers, 12 TBD Devastator torpedo bombers, and 6 F-4F Wildcat fighters rolled forward for launch. 
The air group was a patchwork. Some pilots had joined just days before, filling gaps left by losses in earlier battles. Engines roared, propellers blurred, and within minutes the strike group was airborne, climbing into the clear morning sky. Their target, the Japanese carrier force threatening midway. As the formation sped west, radio silence hung heavy. Each man knew the odds. The torpedo planes would fly low and slow, drawing enemy fire, while the Dauntlesses would attack from altitude, searching for a gap in the swirling chaos below. At 10.20, Yorktown's bombers found their mark. Soryu, one of Japan's frontline carriers, was caught in the middle of air operations, her decks crowded with fueled and armed planes. Three 1,000-pound bombs from Yorktown's SBDs punched through the flight deck, igniting a chain of explosions that turned Soryu into a furnace. Black smoke boiled skyward, visible for miles. By 1026, the Japanese carrier was burning from bow to stern. Yorktown's strike had landed with devastating effect. For a brief moment, the balance of the Pacific War hung in the air, shaped by the courage of Buckmaster's men and the precision of their attack. Smoke still hung over the water as salvage crews scrambled below decks, fighting to keep Yorktown alive. Hours after the carrier's flight deck went silent, Chief Water Tender Oscar V. Peterson stood in the engineering spaces, waist deep in scalding water, his hands locked on the valves that controlled steam and pressure. Flames licked at the bulkheads. Peterson, already badly burned, refused to leave his post. He kept the boilers in check, buying precious minutes for his shipmates to contain the flooding. His actions would earn him the Medal of Honor, though he would not survive the day. Above, officers ordered counter-flooding, filling compartments on the opposite side of the torpedo hits, to try and right the listing ship. Pumps rattled, hoses snaked through the passageways, and sailors worked in darkness, choking on fumes. By nightfall, there was hope. The list had eased. Yorktown floated, battered but upright, as crews prepared to tow her back to Pearl Harbor. But beneath the waves, danger lurked. On June 6, 1942, Japanese submarine I-168 slipped past the destroyer screen, unseen in the confusion. Four torpedoes streaked toward the wounded carrier. Two slammed into Yorktown's hull. Another found the nearby destroyer Haman, which exploded and sank in minutes, taking many of her crew with her. The final blow was merciless. Water poured through the shattered hull. Salvage teams scrambled topside as the carrier rolled sharply to port. At dawn on June 7th, Yorktown capsized and slipped beneath the surface, taking 141 men with her. The fight was over. The sea claimed her at last. For more than half a century, Yorktown rested undisturbed on the ocean floor, her exact location lost to time and memory. The Pacific swallowed her whole, 16,650 feet down, beyond the reach of divers or wartime salvage. Survivors spoke of an unfinished story, a silent grave with no marker. Then, in May 1998, the silence was broken. Dr. Robert Ballard, already renowned for finding the Titanic, led a team equipped with deep-toe sonar and remotely operated vehicles, ROVs capable of withstanding the immense pressure of the abyss. Guided by wartime coordinates and drift calculations, Ballard's crew swept a search box northeast of Midway. Days passed with only empty seafloor and scattered debris. Then the monitors flickered to life. The ROV's lights swept across a steel hull, upright and almost eerily intact. The nameplate, Yorktown, stood out against the dark, still legible after 56 years. Her flight deck, battered by war but unmistakable, stretched into the blackness. Anti-aircraft guns sat in place, their barrels pointed skyward, as if still on watch. The ship's structure had survived the decades. Catwalks, rails, even scattered tools and fittings frozen in time. Ballard's voice, recorded during the first pass, captured the moment. She sits upright, her hull and flight deck almost untouched, 
as if still waiting for her crew to come home. The technology that found her also offered closure. For families and historians, the ghost of Yorktown was finally seen. Her story transformed from legend to living record, her sacrifice preserved in the cold, silent deep. In June 1942, USS Yorktown launched 35 aircraft at 8.40 a.m., helping to cripple the Japanese fleet at Midway. Just three days later, after heroic damage control and a final submarine attack, she slipped beneath the Pacific, lost for 56 years at a depth of 16,650 feet. Archival records and ROV footage confirm her flight deck and nameplate remain intact, a testament to both her construction and the sacrifice of her crew. Yet some wartime records, including details of salvage efforts and enemy targeting decisions, remain classified or incomplete. The rediscovery in 1998 by Dr. Robert Ballard closed a chapter in naval history, transforming a wartime loss into a documented legacy. Yorktown's service and loss changed the course of the Pacific War, and her enduring presence beneath the waves ensures that the courage and ingenuity of her crew are not forgotten.